Hi guys. Well, for the few of you sticking with me, we have now made it to chapter 15 of Peruvian Plunge, which we are going to title Amazon Massacre. And we're going to kick off with this quote from my number one favorite uh, <clears throat> anti-war song called The Band Played Waltzing Matilda, which I think is by uh, Tommy and Liam Makem. <clears throat> For ten weary weeks I kept myself alive in that mad world of blood, death, and fire. All we could do was just try to survive while all around us the corpses piled higher. And it is now Monday morning, June 8th, 2009, in the Mame Wildlife Center. By the time my second Monday morning at Manu Wildlife Center rolled around, I was as firmly rooted in my routine as any other wage slave working there. The two critical differences being I was receiving no wages and I was free to split at any time, assuming I could find a boat. Coffee at eight, mornings in my kapok tree, gourmet lunch at noon, Afternoons riding in the lodge, sunset over the canopy, gourmet dinner at 7, English classes at 9, bedtime at 10.30. Spirit had whispered to me that I probably would not be finishing out my 60-day contract I had made with the mythical Elizabeth Vargas and Cusco to teach English to the even more mythical Indian staff at the lodge. However, my love of the kapok tree, not to mention the gourmet meals and hot showers, provided the perfect rationale I needed to ignore the whisper of spirit and to just roll with it until the universe came up with a better excuse for me to pull up stakes in the jungle than the nattering negativity of Kursita Ratchetta. <clears throat> In hindsight, therefore, I guess it's no surprise that Spirit used the vehicle of Kurtzita to let me know it was time to abandon my watchtower ten stories up a tree in the Amazon rainforest, as painful as that was for me, and to move on to my next chapter. At lunch that Monday, Kurtzita paid Miranda and me a rare unwelcome visit. This time, she was not in a huff over some imagined crime yours truly had committed against her role as undisputed chief of the territory. This rage, apparently, was directed some 500 miles to the north, up near the Ecuador border in a town called Bagua, where three days earlier, a band of crazy Indians had attacked and murdered some defenseless cops. Even with Miranda translating the garbled Spanglish, something just did not add up about Kurtzita's reports. Based on the Peruvian media's reports, also known as the Peruvian government's reports. About a bunch of spear-chucking savages taking out a bunch of defenseless soldiers. The uneasy intuition gnawed at me during my sundown meditation in the canopy, and between dinner and class, I finagled my way into the inner sanctum of Kurtzita's office to ferret out the truth of what had really gone down in Bagua, Peru, in the early morning hours of Friday, June 5th, 2009. Scratching the surface of my internet investigation into the meltdown at Bagua, 
I had to admit that Kurtzita's Kurt report initially did accurately describe at least the soldier's side of the story. Apparently, a band of Amazonian natives in the oil-rich north of Peru really had taken out 22 cops on Friday. <clears throat> Since nobody, not even the native community, was denying the allegations that at least some of these soldiers were speared to death, it could be safely assumed that these guys, at least, were unarmed. Peruvian President Alan Garcia, who had set this tragic series of events into motion on May 18th when he had sent the soldiers to Bagua to quash the, quote, national emergency caused by a bunch of pissed off but peaceful Indians who had been blocking a road, a river, and, most importantly, an oil pipeline since April 26, was predictably reacting to this predictable series of events by ranting to the government-friendly Peruvian press and anyone else who would listen to his squawking about those greedy savages hogging all those natural resources that did not belong to them just because they had lived there for 20,000 years. As I scratched a little deeper, I began to find, buried down near the bottom of the various accounts, reports of some 30 or so natives, depending on the source, who had also died in the crossfire. Aha! So the truth begins to emerge. I cast a wider net in my search and sniffed around to see what BBC, Survival, International, Amazon Watch, and Democracy Now! had to say on the subject. Not surprisingly, as I continued to move from the right to left in my search, i.e. from mainstream to alternative media sources, an entirely different picture of this unprovoked attack by a band of spear-chucking savages on the warpath against a few innocent, defenseless cops began to emerge. If you choose to believe, as I did and do, the lefties' view of what happened, this is what you would believe. At the first crack of dawn on Friday, June 5th, a bunch of soldiers, including some in helicopters, opened fire on a peaceful group of protesters, many of whom were still asleep, first scattering them with tear gas and then mowing them down with live bullets as they ran for their lives into the hills. By the time the smoke and dust and tear gas had cleared, dozens, if not hundreds according to some accounts, of men, women, and children lay dead and dying. Alberto Pizango, the leader of the Indian Revolt that led up to this national emergency, had narrowly escaped with his own life and was holding up in the Nicaraguan embassy to save his ass. Rumors were pouring out of the hills that hundreds of people were still unaccounted for and that soldiers had been seen burning, burying, and dumping corpses in the river. Guys, this is one case where I'll let you Google Bagua, Peru, June 5th, 2009, and reach your own conclusions. I'll be the first to admit that my honky ass wasn't anywhere near the place, and therefore I can't provide you with any first-hand reports of the action. Right about the time one of the biggest showdowns in the Amazon jungle since the murder of Chico Mendez by the Planet Eaters 20 years ago was going down, your intrepid reporter and defender of native rights was committing the subversive and revolutionary crime of feeding a banana to a kinkajou as part of his crusade to kick big oil out of the Amazon while fomenting a planet-wide revolution in consciousness from the top of a kapok tree 
500 miles away from the action. Although I can, although I cannot bring you any first-hand reports from the battlefield in Bagua, what I can offer you at the risk of temporarily interrupting my own narrative flow is this hopefully concise, way oversimplified, wee bit subjective, behind-the-scenes analysis of what the hell really led up to the massacre at Bagua. Where to begin this rant? To fast forward through 500 years of rape and plunder of the Amazon rainforest by every imaginable breed of planet eater, I want to begin this story on June 28, 2008. That was the day that Peruvian President Alan Garcia, in a frenzied effort to kiss the asses of George Bush and Dick Cheney and their band of planet-eating cronies, making Garcia and his own batch of planet-eating cronies in Lima, very rich men in the process, signed Lei 1090, that's L-E-Y 1090, Google it if you want to read the exact wording in Spanish. By this monumental stroke of his planet-eating pen, together with a related odious piece of legislation known as Lay 1064, Garcia effectively rolled out the red carpet to every imaginable breed of planet-eater, mostly American multinational energy corporations, to come loot vast swaths of undeveloped stretches of the Peruvian Amazon, ostensibly under the moniker of free trade with the United States. The biggest winner of all of this sell-off of his own country to the highest bidder was American Big Oil and its shareholders and ultimately its customers, who would be anybody reading this who owns a car. By the time Garcia's bloody signature had dried on the page, 72% of the Peruvian Amazon, an area of rich biological diversity roughly the size of California, was open territory more than five times the area open to big oil five minutes earlier. It was one of the biggest planet-eating coups in the history of mankind. You could hear champagne glasses clinking from Dallas to Beijing. There were just a couple of small details that Garcia had conveniently overlooked in his zeal to buddy up to big oil, not the least of which was the fact that many of the suddenly valid oil and gas leases covered millions of acres of federally protected, hmm, federally protected forest land ostensibly safeguarding some of the most fragile biodiversity hotspots on the planet. No problema, said the Peruvian government. We're still protecting the land and the trees and the animals and the rivers. We're simply offering the oil and gas underneath the land to the oil companies. Apparently, Rumpelstiltskin was to burrow under the jungle at night and get the oil from the Amazon to gas stations, gas stations in Peoria. <clears throat> Undeterred by howls of protests from environmentalists the world over, big oil fell all over itself, grabbing up huge chunks of rainforest in a feeding frenzy that would have been the envy of any Amazon River school of piranhas. And move fast they must. Big oil had already reduced the rich oil fields of Amazonian Ecuador to a sad string of sludge-filled toxic waste pits 
earning themselves a multi-billion dollar environmental lawsuit in the process that will be working its way through the court system for years. Millions of gallons of crude worth millions of dollars have been flowing through pipelines on the Peruvian side of the border for years. The planet eaters needed to get more pipelines from the Amazon to the Pacific Ocean up and running before the finite gravy train, like all gravy trains in the Amazon, ran dry. <clears throat> and before those damn tree-hugging, bliss-ninny environmentalists got their shit together enough to hire some legal guns to shoot loopholes <clears throat> in this gargantuan <coughs> Gaian giveaway. <clears throat> The other small detail that Garcia and his free trade gang of cronies in the U.S. conveniently overlooked in their mad rush to suck the Amazon dry of its underground rivers of blood money were those pesky bands of bloodthirsty savages that had called the Peruvian Amazon home for some 500 centuries. Since being invaded by the real bloodthirsty savages from Europe beginning 200 years ago, not to mention the most bloodthirsty savages, the most bloodthirsty savages of the whole lot, the American-backed rubber barons of barely a century ago, those pesky Indians had been at worst one more breed of mosquito to slap, and at best, a handy source of dirt cheap, if not slave labor. <clears throat> One facet of 21st century Amazon native reality that both the planet eaters and the bleeding hearts, and I would include myself in that second camp of ignoramus, have both overlooked the fact that the overwhelming majority of modern-day natives are neither spear-chucking wild men nor noble savages. They are, by and large, educated, though poverty-stricken, and intelligent fellow planetary citizens who are smart enough to know when they're getting fucked once again by the man, but this time around, they're mad as hell, and as Bagua proved, they're simply not going to eat the Planet Eater shit anymore. Smart guys. <clears throat> Perhaps the most remarkable aspect of the whole Bagua massacre mess was how well the foreign oil companies almost escaped the whole domestic Peruvian fracas with clean noses and no blood on their hands. What a coup d'etat of planet-eating PR genius that was! The whole story from all sides of the media spectrum was presented as Alan Garcia's Peruvian government versus the Amazon Indians. <clears throat> Obviously, references were made to Garcia's cozy relationship to big oil, but the staggering extent to which Garcia is owned by the Planet Eaters was simply either ignored or more likely not understood by the journalists covering the headline story in Bagua. If the reporters had taken the time and energy to, to dig about one inch under the surface to uncover the squirming morass of David Lynch bugs lurking there, the headlines would have read, Big Oil Massacres Hundreds Using Bullet, Bullets from Puppet Garcia. You can bet your ass that at some point between May 18th and June 4th that a very rich white man probably from Texas, told the president of Peru in no uncertain terms. 
God damn it, Garcia, if you ever want to play high the weenie with some high-class hooker from Miami in your Lauderdale condo again, you'll figure out some way to get that oil flowing through that pipeline again. Do I make myself clear as Cairo syrup? Make no mistake about it, that was the call that got all those Indians and those 22 soldiers killed not some direct orders from Puppet Garcia. <clears throat> and why you can also bet that same very rich white man from Texas ripped Garcia a new asshole on Saturday, June 6th <clears throat> for the some way he came up with to get the oil flowing again. The undisputable fact remains that the massacre accomplished its goal. The pipeline and the road and the river have been open for business again ever since. Hopefully the silver lining in this dark cloud of Peruvian history will be the light that the international press got to shine on Big Oil's dark game in the Amazon at least until Michael Jackson died and the world turned its attention to much more pressing matters. <clears throat> Bowing to international pressure from human rights groups the world over, Garcia, after making sure the oil was flowing again to keep his boss happy, admitted that, quote, perhaps a few mistakes were made hmm, at Bagua as his, as his country teetered on the brink of silver war, of civil war, Garcia even rescinded the odious piece of legislation that started the whole process, for 90 days anyway, giving the planet-eating PR flax time to get their spin control spinning and more oil flowing. Garcia, meanwhile, is damned if he does or damned if he doesn't keep the, <clears throat> keep the legislation intact at the end of the cooling off period. Either way, lawsuits will be flying and heads will be rolling in the fallout. <clears throat> and here at this juncture, I will take perhaps my most foolhardy Peruvian plunge of all and give you the doom and gloomy hand bone view of what Amazon natives really think about big oil. To understand how I arrived at my bliss ninny bristling conclusion, you need to go back and carefully reread all those supports from the massacre at Bagua, particularly well documented statements made by protest leaders such as Alberto Pizongo. If you do, you will notice that the protesters in Bagua and other natives all over the rest of the Peruvian Amazon are saying, no matter how much the dirt-worshipping, tree-hugging environmentalists in the U.S. with their noble, savage fantasies of uncontacted tribes don't want to hear this, that by and large, modern-day Amazon Indians are not categorically opposed to all oil and gas drilling, or logging, or mining, or ranching on their ancestral lands. Go back and reread that sentence as many times as you need to in order to erase your noble savage fantasy because that is just what it is, a fucking fantasy. <clears throat> By and large, what modern day Amazon natives are opposed to, and rightfully so, is a bunch of fucking foreign planet eaters in cahoots with their cronies in Lima, storming into the natives' ancestral forest homes yet again to do whatever they please without consulting or, more importantly, without financially rewarding the folks who have lived there for 20,000 years. It's just not the right thing to do. To be blunt but honest about it, 
what the natives are demanding, and rightfully so, after getting pushed out of the way and fucked over by the planet eaters for 500 years, is their rightful piece of the planet eating pie. What a concept! Those guys actually want to get paid, and they're not talking about some lousy beans and fish hooks. They're talking about some good old American greenbacks. What gall, those greedy bastards! I can already hear the howls of derision from the deluded tree huggers reading these callous conclusions because until I came down here to Peru and looked around with my own two eyes and talked to a bunch of Amazon Indians and took the time to read the research and listen to the educated opinions of a lot of folks who know a hell of a lot more about the subject than you and I will ever know, I was one of those deluded tree huggers myself. After only two months in Peru, where I sit writing these words beside a waterfall on the banks of the Mother of God in a ravaged rainforest cut down by the local Indians themselves, I am still more than ever a tree hugger. It's just that I'm not as deluded as I was a couple of months ago. <clears throat> One area of brief anthropological research I delved into, particularly the book of Mixed Blood by Peter Gow, that helped relieve me of my noble savage fantasy burden was a study of the rubber boom, particularly how that half century of hellfire and brimstone, which burned out by 1920, rained down on Amazon natives and shaped their attitudes. Volumes have been written about that genocide with American blood money at its source, so here I'll just illuminate this one aspect most germane to my thesis. When the uncontacted tribes read the We Don't Want to Be Contacted tribes fled into the deepest recesses of the Peruvian Amazon more than a century ago, they were not, as I reported incorrectly in previous rants when I still suffered from the noble savage fantasy, running to the forest on some spiritual quest to get back to Gaia, nor were they running away from the material goods the white traders were bringing them from downriver as though suffering from romantic noble savage fantasy fever might presume. They were, sim they were simply and sensibly trying to get their asses out of the clutches of the unbelievably ruthless and bloodthirsty rubber barons intent on tracking down slaves, men, women, and children to work in their hellish rubber gathering operations in the jungle, just as white slave traders in Africa had hired aggressive black tribes to hunt down weaker tribes of their own race, so too did the white rubber bosses employ stronger Amazon and Indian tribes to do their evil bidding for them. Tribes such as the peaceful Masha Gwenga, including the ancestors of my buddy Marino, did not stop running until they were back into the Stone Age again, but this was not because they had some noble desire to escape modernization. They just wanted to save their skins from being sold into slavery. Can you blame them? This was and is a temporary aberration, and you can believe it will begin to snowball in the opposite direction as more and more young, educated, uncontacted Stone Age Indians, such as Marino, begin to drift out of their deep woods hideouts and back into the land of satellite dishes, cell phones, video games, iPods, etc a land which gets closer every year. 
I couldn't make this up, guys. As I was writing that last sentence, four Amazon natives evicted me from their gasoline-powered canoe so they could get their big plastic boom box across the Mother of God River. And when they get out here and find that grandpa's stories about bloodthirsty white slave traders are no longer true, you can bet shotguns to spears that they're going to stay out here in the land of Oreos and cold beer and not head back to their dirt floor shabono in the boonies. You wouldn't either, and neither would I, no matter how loudly I squawk about little plastic baubles. Now that I have been relieved of this noble savage burden that had me blinded in blissful ignorance for so many years, I can look at and consider Amazon natives for what they really are. Just like you and me and like any other group of individuals with brains, desires, and free wills, they, like the rest of us, have widely, wildly divergent viewpoints on all different subjects, opinions that social scientists could no doubt graph into bell curves that would probably look a whole lot like the bell curves of rich gringos. A few radicals on the left, a few reactionaries on the right, and a whole bunch of apathetic, I don't know, and I don't give a shits in the middle. I have just enough lingering hints of the noble savage fantasy left in my own jaded, doom and gloomy worldview to believe that on the subject of big oil development in the Peruvian Amazon anyway, that the bell curve would list, would list just a little bit to the left of gringos who most benefit from the carnage in the Amazon, i.e. people who drive cars that are fueled by Gaia's blood, but I'd probably be proven wrong should I ever try to prove that hypothesis. If you were to pluck your average poverty-stricken Peruvian Amazon native from his squalid dirt floor tin-roofed shack and set him at the controls of Hunt Oil Company, complete with the attendant perk of the climate-controlled, mosquito-free mansion in some leafy suburb of Dallas with a few of the fort view of the 14th green, chances are, and trust me on this one, guys, it would be business as usual in the Amazon jungle, and not one oil or gas pipeline valve would be turned off because of the damage being done to the natives' ancestral homeland. Whether you are a rich gringo or a poverty-stricken Amazon Indian, there's essentially three tacks you can take on the subject of oil and gas development in the Amazon. You, like yours truly, could be totally, militantly, steadfastly opposed to any and all development in the very heart and lungs of Gaia. At the other extreme, you could, like the planet eaters, be gung-ho to suck every last drop of oil and gas out of the jungle as quickly and cheaply as possible, the planet be damned. Or you could hold the view, as the planet eaters will tell you with the straight face that they do, despite volumes of tragic evidence to the contrary, that oil and gas development is compatible with Amazon conservation under strict environmental safeguards. If you believe that myth, I have a great deal on an eco-lodge or 12 in the path of a proposed ecologically sensitive pipeline in the Peruvian Amazon. Of course, there is a fourth and probably largest viewpoint on the matter, and the one that the planet eaters are banking on in their push to ram their evil projects through, which is the, I don't give a shit what you do as long as you don't do it in my backyard opinion. So, I finally admit it, guys. 
Just as it's possible to find a 49-year-old real estate agent from Austin, Texas to wave the keep the big oil, keep big oil out of the Amazon jungle banner, it's still possible to scrounge up a few, very few, long-haired, loincloth, spear-wielding Amazon Indian poster children to wave the same red flag and to carry the dangerous noble savage myth forward, i.e. the famous fake uncontacted tribe photo of a bunch of Indians in war paint supposedly shooting arrows at a helicopter which was circulated widely last year until the embarrassed photographer came forward and admitted he faked the photo because he could not find any real uncontacted tribes to photograph. However, as I'm learning the hard way, Hardline environmentalists are suffering from a serious and dangerous delusion if they automatically jump to the perfectly logical and understandable conclusion that the very people who stand to lose the most from oil and gas development in the Amazon will be jumping on the bandwagon with them. Believe me, big oil can't afford to buy and they have bought plenty of poster children of their own to advance their own evil agenda. For this reason, I have reluctantly elected, more like capitulated, to divorce myself from the dead-end pursuit of a non-existent, noble, savage bandwagon of almost non-existent support from the brainwashed Amazon native community. I leave that thankless task to others, and I wish them well. From here on out, as from day one, my call for a planet-wide revolution in consciousness comes directly from the heart of Gaia and the voice of spirit, and Gaia and I invite everyone, red, white, yellow, brown, black, purple, or green to join us in this absurd revolution of awakening souls as I have literally nothing better to do with my life. I will have plenty more to say about Amazon natives as this improbable tale unfolds, but for now, let me return to my story and say end of this rant. And that wraps up chapter 15, where we head to chapter 16, goodbye to Manu Wildlife Center. Coming right up.